Welcome back. We're almost done. This is copyright three, part three, and we're in the textbook at pages 189 to 196 and 220 to 223. We're going to look, we're going to finish up the main user's rights and defenses. So we looked in the first module at freedom of expression and the public interest. Then we looked at the three main ones, right? And we're going to keep looking at them now. So we looked at the educational institutions and libraries and museums as exceptions. Then we looked at the common carrier exception. And now we'll look at a third main one that we're going to consider for the course. And that is the fair dealing exception, which to a large extent we've already discussed quite a bit. Then we'll move on to a discussion of moral rights. So all that happens under the economic rights part of the Copyright Act, which is the main regime. So we'll look briefly at the end at how moral rights work in a context similarly of infringement. So what is an infringement of your moral rights and what can you do about it, right? Before that, I want us to briefly think of something that was mentioned in a number of the cases that we looked at this week, but that we haven't really looked at before because it's part of, you know, this basic conceptual set of notions that exist in the law. But it's helpful to clarify them here. Even though it's not, you know, specific to intellectual property law, it's mentioned and you kind of have to understand it a little bit. And it's this concept of strict liability. And you're told a bunch of times that the Copyright Act is a strict liability regime. What does it mean? Well, we'll think about, um, you know, analogies from other areas of the law. So we'll think about a crime, right? And then we'll think about a tort. And that'll give you a bit of an idea of what it means to have strict liability. So let's say I kill someone, right? Well, typically, right, we would know that as murder. And we know that murder is illegal under the criminal code in Canada, and therefore, if it is shown that I've committed murder, right, then I'll go to jail because I've done something that's illegal under Canadian law. What is murder? Well, murder, and that's true for most crimes, right, has two aspects, the action and the intent. The actus reus and the mens rea, you can say it a bunch of ways, but most crimes have two aspects. So unlike other areas of the law, basically we want to really make sure that you did it on purpose because generally we'll put you in a cage for a long time and in a civilized society that's one of the worst violations of your rights, right? We're basically restraining all your rights. We're putting you in a cage and that's going to be true for a pretty long time, especially in the case of murder. So we want to be really sure that we get this right. And so we have the standard that the thing has to be intentional. And so what's a murder? A murder is a death, right? Killing of another person and intent generally. So the voluntary killing of another. And so I killed someone, but not by accident. Killing someone by accident is not a crime generally speaking. Assuming I wasn't, you know, recklessly negligent, assuming it was just an accident, and I wasn't doing anything wrong. You know, I was just, you know, driving very safely on the road, and then something happened that is not my fault. There's an accident and someone dies. It's not murder. It's death, but it's not murder because I didn't, you know, do anything wrong morally. And why is that? Because I didn't have intent. It's a killing, but it's not murder. Murder is the intentional killing of another person. It's not always true, but we're simplifying things here. And what is that? Well, intent means that it's not strict liability. It means that the legal liability of my action, right, the fact that I can be sued and, and then put in a cage, comes out of the fact not that I've killed someone in and of itself, not a, sorry, not that I've caused the death of someone in and of itself, but rather that I've done that intentionally. It's not strict liability because liability under the law attaches not just from the action, but from the intention as well. What if we have a tort? So you'll recall that we talked about negligence in, um, I think, last week's session. 
And what is negligence, right? Negligence is a tort, extra contractual liability. Basically, a reason for someone to sue me even though I don't have a contractual obligation. We haven't made a contract and agreed to something that I violated. We haven't made a contract at all. But you can still sue me in some situations. If I'm careless, right, and I cause harm to someone else, then they can sue me under negligence. And that's because I have this general obligation of doing, of, of being reasonably careful in my actions. If I'm not reasonably careful in my actions and I cause, second part, harm, third part, to another person, they can sue me. We don't have this intent here, right? I just have to have been negligent, right? I might have, you know, discharged my firearm in my backyard, legitimately thinking that I wouldn't hurt anyone. It doesn't matter that I didn't want to hurt or kill anyone, right? What matters is I was negligent. In intent is not important in, in that specific situation, or is not directly important. What's important is my actions represented negligence and caused harm. Obviously, you know, the very fact of being negligent kind of has an intentional aspect to it indirectly, right? It's worth acknowledging that. Of course, when you do something dumb, typically you should kind of know that it's dangerous. And if you don't know, you should know. And that's kind of intent, but definitely not in the same way as we've seen here. So what does it mean to say that liability under the Copyright Act is strict liability? Essentially, it means that intent is not a part of the issue. And so we don't look at what the consequences are for copyright infringement or for most of what we're going to look at in this course. We do look at what infringement is, right? What, what are the rights? How do you infringe them? Then what happens? But we don't look at, right, what the consequences are. How do you do the math on how much money the person knows after they've infringed upon the copyright? or whether someone can go to jail. In fact, you can go to jail for copyright infringement in some situations. We don't look at that systematically. But what does it mean for there to be strict liability? It means that intent is not part of the offense. And so, me infringing copyright. What's the important part in that? Well, the important part is the action. So liability attaches to the action, not the intent. And therefore, if I've done the infringing act, if I've copied a book, sold it, if I've reproduced it without the consent, if I've performed it in public, right, intent is not a part of the offense. And so I might be a very nice high school teacher who wanted to perform a play at my high school for 200 people, and I never thought, right, that it was illegal for me to just buy the, the play and perform it in public. I might even have thought that, you know, I bought the book, I paid for the play, and therefore, you know, I, I did my duty. I, I didn't take it off the internet. That doesn't matter. That's performance in public. It's illegal because liability attaches to the action, not the intent. Intent, in general, is not relevant. Again, construing this in broad terms, not always that simple, but for our purposes, that's generally what you have to know. So, going back to users' rights and defenses, What's the last one we look at? It is fair dealing, and we'll look at it pretty briefly because we've basically said much of what needs to be said about the exception already. So fair dealing is a broad exception that applies to everyone. So it applies to all the users, whether they have a right, don't have a right, whether they're a company, a nonprofit, a person, doesn't matter. A user, any user, can use that exception and it's the broadest one, right? So it's the one that covers the most situations and the most different types of situations. And so what is fair dealing? Fair dealing is two things used for a stated purpose, right? So one of the purposes that are enumerated in the act and a use that is fair, hence why it's called fair dealing. And in the act, you know, the main ones that we said are the news, the commentary, the research. Basically, these are the main ones, right? 
using stuff to comment on it, to show it on the news, to comment on it afterwards, or to conduct your research. These are exceptions that are covered, again, as long as the use is fair. But you still have to look at the trigger issue, right? Because I might not even be infringing copyright, because you'll recall copyright gives you exclusive right to the four things we said and, and a bunch of others, but only on the work or a substantial part thereof. And so if I'm doing my research, right, I'm just using a little part of a book and with proper attribution, then, right, that is not even copyright infringement. So I don't have to say, you know, I don't have to use this defense. And as you'll recall from the taxonomy I gave you in the first, um, in the first model, right, the defense happens after. The defense is I've infringed upon your rights, but I've got a good reason. So in some situations, you don't need the defense because you don't infringe upon the right. Because the copyright is you can't reproduce, perform in public, etc., but only the work or a substantial part thereof. So if I'm not using a substantial part of the work in my research, I don't need this. Because this is, I've used the work or a substantial part thereof, but I'm okay under the defense, right? Well, if I've not used a substantial part thereof, I'm not even infringing copyright. I'm using the work legitimately, right? in a way that does not infringe the exclusive rights of the copyright holder. So again, I can do all the things I've just mentioned in a way that's non-infringing. When it is infringing, right, when it's the work or a substantial part thereof, and I'm doing one of the things that we said last week are only, that only the copyright holder can do or someone they've authorized, then I can use the defense. Hopefully by now this is clear this taxonomy of the defense happening after the infringement. The defense is after you've shown infringement, you've got a good excuse. If you're showing there's no infringement, it's not a defense, it's something else. It's just no infringement. So, as we said, there's these purposes. The main ones are research, private study, education, uh, the news, as we said, right? 2012, the, the, the Copyright Act was amended to add some purposes. Education. We discussed this in the Law Society of Upper Canada case. Educational institutions have their own exception, as we said. The first one we discussed on those, uh, of those three, right, in, in the capsule just previous to this one, they have their own exception that's called the, the exception for educational institutions. But they also benefit from the fair dealing exception, and that is because it's illicit purpose. The purpose of education is covered under fair dealing and therefore you can claim it under that. Um, and the other purposes that were also added in 2012 are parody and satire. And these are um, the main ones, right? Um, as I said, along with research, the news, and criticism, basically. So, what does fair dealing mean, you ask? Well, again, dealing that is fair for one of these purposes. What does fair mean? Well, we don't know, right? That's why we pay lawyers and judges. It's not written in the Copyright Act. Section 29, right? I made a mistake, by the way, in the first capsule. Section 28 is moral rights, 29 is fair dealing. I, I think I said 29 as, as um, moral rights, but you'll see obviously from the Act that moral rights is 28 and fair dealing is 29. So, under section 29, Right? What is fair? What is a fair dealing? It's not defined. So the court says basically it's a contextual analysis. So again, what's the legal standard? The legal standard is common sense. We said that in the context of other things under the copyright regime. And so usually what the court will do, right, is it's going to say, well, you can look at these six things because they're good indications either because, you know, we just made them up or because prior cases indicate that these are the most relevant factors, but that it's just indicative. It's not conjunctive, right? You don't have to meet one, two, three, four, five, and six. That's conjunctive. Instead, it is a contextual analysis. So you can look at these six factors, but they don't all have to be there. The factors inform your analysis. So you use your common sense to evaluate if it's fair, 
taking into account the six things. The six things help you get a broad view of whether it's reasonable or not, and because it's contextual, you can look at other things that might be relevant in a specific situation. We have the Law Society of Upper Canada case, which I've summarized so many times now that I won't do it again. But yeah, this library, this photocopying machine, copies stuff for people, generally for lawyers who ask for a copy to do their research. Well, what is the lawyer doing when they're doing research? They're doing a use that is fair, right? Because under the fair dealing exception, research is a purpose that is covered. And so even if they take a substantial part of the work, which is an infringing purpose uh, of the rights of the copyright holder, they can still claim the fair dealing exception, right? I'm using these words interchangeably, right? A fair use, fair dealing, these are all the same thing, right? The use you're doing is fair dealing if it's fair, fair use. Um, and so the question is, in that case, as I said, what the, the Law Society of Upper Canada's role is in there. As I said, the court uses this, again, broad idea of what copyright law is about. This balance between the rights of the copyright holder and the rights of the public. You should know this by now. And says, how do we interpret the, the, the exception for fair dealing? to be consistent with the broader purpose of the Copyright Act in general. Because this purpose, right, the reason I repeat it on and on, is because it's the purpose of the Copyright Act. And so whatever we analyze under the Copyright Act, whatever the issue is, right, the first place to look for guidance is what's the Copyright Act as a whole about, and what it's about is achieving this balance of rights. And, and doing it in a way that is fair. And so, right, what does the court say? First thing the court says that's pretty important is at paragraphs 49 and 50. The court says the defenses are an integral part of the regime. And that's important, right? So the court says, right, it's not just your economic rights as a copyright holder that are a big part of the Copyright Act. We already said they are. And that means that they have to be interpreted purposively, which means, you know, broadly, which means with regard to their purpose, but generously. So generously, but not so generously that they overflow their stated purpose. And what does the court say at paragraphs 4 and 950 at first, right? The court says that um, the, um, the dealing that the, the defenses are, um, are an integral part of the, of, the, of the regime, right? End of paragraph 48 says users' rights are not just loopholes. Both owner rights and users' rights should therefore be given the fair and balanced reading that, be, that befits the remedial legislation. Very nice wording. And what does that mean? Well, the defenses all of the defenses are to be interpreted somewhat broadly. And so the court says the defenses are not exceptions, right? And, and that's in line with what I, I told you already. I told you they're not exceptions because they're not about the same thing. The rights of the copyright holder are about his economic monopoly. So recall that. The defenses are not. The defenses are about people doing things that don't you know, jeopardize that. And that's how you interpret the defenses, right? You say, you know, these things should be allowed because it doesn't affect really the economic rights of the copyright holder. Me doing research is not going to make the copyright holder sell fewer things, make less money, especially not in the way that it would if I were to make copies and start selling them and make money in their stead. Court says, right, the, the defenses are not just, and I quote, loopholes. They're integral parts of the regime should be interpreted in the same way. And so we're going to interpret the defenses broadly, right? We're not going to interpret them as, as exceptions, but broadly. And so the fair dealing exception should be given broad interpretation. 
of what it means to do research, for instance. So the court's going to say research is covered, unlike some of the other exceptions we discussed, if it's for profit. That might change the interpretation. We might say that your research is less likely or that a, a smaller part of it is, is covered under the exception if it's for profit, but still, interpreted broadly, research can be for profit. That's fine. Same for the other listed purpose. Then the court, of course, reminds you at paragraph 50 what you have to show. The purpose, which is listed, which we just listed, in that case research, and that it's fair. And what does the court do? Um, in that case, it gives you a list of things to look at. And the court says, again, these are not cumulative, not conjunctive. You don't have to show all of them. They're just helpful in your analysis. One, the purpose of the dealing. Two, the character of the dealing. Three, the amount of the dealing. What is the dealing there? It's the infringing action. And so if I'm saying I'm doing research that is infringing upon the rights, the copyright holder, the dealing is the research. And so we'll look at what the purpose of my research is, the character of it, the amount, basically the amount of the you know, work that I'm using in my research. Four, alternatives to the dealing. So could I have done my research in a way that was no less convenient, but that would not involve me using copyrighted work, right? Could I use the, the, the copy that I can find online of an article before it's published that it's free? Perhaps that's going to be that's factored into the equation. The nature of the work, right? The work here is not the dealing. It's not the research. It's the work, the stuff I'm copying, the copyrighted stuff. So the nature of it is going to be important and the effect of the dealing on the work. More specifically, oftentimes, that's going to mean the effect of my research, the dealing on the work, on the stuff I'm copying, to the extent that it limits the legitimate commercial monopoly of the copyright holder. So the court says, right, in that case, the Law Society of Upper Canada, what is it doing? It's putting photocopying machines there for people to use them, and more importantly, it's making copies for people. And so a lawyer will say, I need a copy of this decision, and they'll, they'll copy it for them, send it to them. What if that's copyright infringement? As we said, right, we basically analyzed this in the previous capsule. What if it is copyright infringement? Well, right, it's the work or a substantial part thereof. You've got these defenses. So the lawyer that requested the copy can say it's a fair dealing. What are they going to have to show? Well, that it's a purpose that's covered under Section 29 and that it is fair. Lawyer is going to say it's for my research, right? I keep it to myself, it's necessary, and it's fair. It's a small part, you know, and I really need it. And so it's fair. But in that case, we've got again an intermediary. Right? The lawyer can say it's fair dealing because they're meeting the statutory conditions as against the copyright holder, the person who made the judicial decision that being copied. But what about the law society? And as we said in that case, the law society is not just putting a machine there as an intermediary. In that case, it's helping, right? It's making the copies for them. And what does the court say? Well, the law society, to the extent that it's contributing to a potential copyright infringement, can also claim the exception. As we said in the previous capsule, if it's an employee of the law society, it's not the same question. So if the law society tells their employee to go, we'll photocopy this thing, we'll do legal research, we'll figure out what our legal obligations are. That's for its own benefit. The law society is infringing copyright claims the exception. In our case, the employee of the law society is acting for someone else. So that person can claim the exception, but the law society isn't doing it for itself. It's an intermediary, right? Not a content neutral intermediary necessarily, but in that case, it is. And so, right, what does a court say? Well, the court says, that's fine. You can help someone, right, do something that's covered by the fair dealing exception. And on top of that, you can assume that they will. And so 
you can assume, right, that people are going to use your service for legitimate purposes and are going to only ask for copies of stuff to the extent that either it doesn't engage the rights of the copyright holder because it's not a substantial part thereof, or if it's covered by the fair dealing exception. So it's copyright infringement. It's covered by the exception, the fair dealing exception, right? So the Law Society of Upper Canada can assume that. And why is that? Well, the court looks at, right, um, the, uh, the precautions that were taken by the Law Society, right? So the court looks at um, the, various, um, the various criteria that we've, just, that we've just mentioned and says that the Law Society is not to be held responsible. Right, and so they apply the various criteria that we've discussed. Basically, says you know we won't go through all of them because it's not that relevant. But the amount of the dealing, right? They're copying small parts, and on top of that, right? They have this policy where if you want a larger portion, someone has to sign off on it. So you can't indiscriminately request photocopying. They have this system in place where if it's a big chunk and therefore likely to infringe copyright, they have a special policy that's gonna apply to make sure that they safeguard the rights of the copyright holder. So, you know, they've got all these policies in place and the amount of the dealing is reasonable. And when it's more than that, you know, they, they make sure that the copyright is not infringed. Court looks at, again, alternatives to the dealing. Well, there are not any, right? There isn't a simple way to look at a non-copyrighted portion of the court decision. So that's not really applicable. The nature of the work, right? The court says, well, you know, judicial decisions are pretty important to the work of the lawyers who ask for the copies of them. And again, it's worth emphasizing, right, this, this policy that you have, sorry, at paragraph 61 of the decision. That's not a statutory requirement. Right? You don't have to have a policy on copying, but it helps. It helps as evidence. And why is that? Well, because it can be evidence that you intend to respect the exception. And therefore, right, it's, it's evidence that you really only want people to use your photocopying service to the extent that's provided by the law. So to the extent that either the patron does not take a substantial part of the work, therefore doesn't do copyright infringement, or does, but is covered by the fair dealing exception, which, you know, provides a, a, a reason to do something that would otherwise be forbidden. And of course, when the, um, the law society has this policy, it helps us understand that um, they're trying to do that. What's interesting as well, at paragraph 63, right? So the policy was at paragraph 61. At paragraph 63, right, you have this question of the evidentiary burden. And so, right, again, helps us understand what the policy is for. The court asks, does the law society have to show that the patrons actually did not infringe copyright? Right, because the, 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 the law society here, very important, is not trying to use the exception for fair dealing in one instance. It's trying to use the exception in all instances, and that's important. Of course, if there's a specific person, right, that uses the photocopying machine for research purposes. Well, in that case, from what we said, from the principles we've said, the Law Society cannot be sued because it helped someone do fair dealing. Even though it didn't do it itself, it's covered by the exception because it helped someone do a protected purpose. But here, right, the law society is being sued in general. We're not saying this person infringed copyright. We're saying you got this service and the law society is saying my entire service is exempt, right? And that's important. And therefore the law society doesn't just say, 
could say a right people will only use my service for legitimate purposes that's not what it's doing here or not the only thing it's doing or the law society could say right i'm not responsible anyway and that's what it's doing here and so what the law society is saying is we intend this to be used for for legitimate purposes but the precedent will apply even if it's not because we took reasonable precautions and so forth and so even if someone does something eventually that is copyright infringement right the law society should be good because a it didn't actively participate in the thing which removes it from copyright liability for the reasons we looked at you know last week or the previous one but second because it had the policies in place and that's important and so the law society is discharging liability for not infringing fair dealing but also for infringing eventual copyright um copyright infringement and in fact right it's trying to say we're not liable for either of those things and what does the court say well the court says okay so you're 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 not saying this guy did his research that would be simple you're saying everyone is probably going to use this for their research for legitimate purposes and so the court says well how do we know that right that's how the court system works when you show up there you have to prove whatever you're alleging and so how do you show right court says do you have to show that every single person is going to use it for legitimate purposes well by default the answer is yes because you're trying to have a conclusion of general applicability and therefore you have to show that it's generally applicable so you'd have to call up these people and have them show it but of course it's very tedious and it gets back to this policy right so the court says right well you got this policy that says you intend for it to be used and the policy also provides safeguards so you have these supervising people who make sure that people are not requesting too much of a work and that is a sufficient proof so you don't have to show that everyone is going to do fair dealing with your service because your policy is evidence enough that that's going to be the case again that's paragraph 63 and it's also stated explicitly paragraph 66 where the court refers to the policy providing quote reasonable safeguards of what of the rights of the copyright holder of course um and again the court says in part based on the fact that it's a non-profit institution right that it's not conducting these activities to make money court says it would be you know unwieldy for us to assume that employees should do this that employees should systematically review everything and in fact as i said it would probably mean that you couldn't have a free library because that would be very expensive um and then there is a few more interesting conclusions right the court says two things that are important first on the effect of the dealing of the work you'll recall that i said this is one of the most important you know of the six characteristics right the court says the effect of the dealing the effect of the photocopying for research purposes on the work the copyrighted decisions judicial decisions how do we assess that mostly by resorting to the commercial monopoly and the court says it doesn't really affect the way that um that that judicial decisions would otherwise be sold more importantly the court says something right that is important the court says that the availability of a license is not relevant and the court says therefore in assessing the effect of the dealing on the work the fact that the people conducting research could have bought the judicial decisions is not directly relevant of course you know if you start selling them then it jeopardizes the monopoly but the fact that you're making a copy for yourself right which is copyright infringement that you're not paying for 
copyright infringement, but you're using the fair dealing exception, so it's allowed, right? Well, the exception is about these uses being legitimate for free. These, user, these uses being legitimate without a license. And therefore the court says, yes, of course all these people conducting research could have paid for it, right? The news station could have paid for the clip it's showing. That is not relevant. And more importantly, it's not relevant because if you think about it a little more, it would basically nullify your defense, right? Because in most cases, unless the person is extremely um, in extreme financial need, they could pay for it. The court says it's not relevant to the analysis. So moving on to our last topic, right? So the, that was users' rights and defenses. We're done with this and we'll get back to this idea of moral rights just a little bit. And so again, what are moral rights? Well, as we said, most of the copyright regime is concerned with economic and not moral rights, concerned with protecting the legitimate commercial monopoly of the copyright holder. But as we said, it is not true, right? Even though all of these rules that we've seen so far, or the vast majority of them apply only to economic rights as interpreted um, and stated in the other sections of the Copyright Act, it is not true that the Copyright Act does not protect moral rights at all. In fact, it does but it does under a different regime that is more restrictive, has different rules. I've said that a bunch of times already, right? And that's under section 28. And you'll recall, how is the standard different? The standard is different because there is, you know, a, a clause at the beginning of the sentence that says, to the prejudice of the honor or reputation of the author. And so unlike copyright infringement, where you just have to show that your right was infringed, Someone copied my thing, or a substantial part thereof, right? In the case of moral rights, it is not enough. And so someone doesn't just breach the integrity of my work. It's not enough. It also has to be to the prejudice of my honor or reputation. Well, see, there's a number of caveats, but that, that limits it a great deal and sets it apart as a separate regime under Section 28. So we have the Tebersch case, right, which... Um, again, we've read before, but they're, they're giving you different sections that discuss different issues. These are big Supreme Court case um, that, um, that essentially set out the law for more than one thing under copyright. And then there's another case that you don't read, right? It's right after in the book, but I didn't assign it to you. But it's discussed in the Tabash case, so we'll discuss it tangentially. And that's the Eaton Center case. What does the court say in Tabash? The Supreme Court, right? Court says... Like I said 25 times already, that the distinction between economic and moral rights is important, paragraph 11, in assessing the remedies. Because, right, the regime is different. A has to be the prejudice or of the honor or reputation of the person who did the work. B, the rights cannot be assigned, as we said. They can be waived. So I can say, I, I, I am waiving my right to object to you misusing my work in that instance for free, for money, whatever it is, but I can assign it. So I can't sell to someone my right to integrity of the work, my section 28 right, and say, you exercise it for me. Give me money now, you exercise it, you know, charge whatever you want. You can't do that. You can do that with your economic rights, not your moral rights. And the court says that the remedies are different as well. Why is that? Well, Economic rights are based on um, the are, are based on uh, rights that are not economic, obviously. And the court says at, section, uh, at paragraph twelve that they're based on a different conception of the work. And so, a common law conception—that's a very reductive way to say it—but that's what the Supreme Court does. Um, a common law conception of art, apparently, is that you make money with it. Which makes sense, of course. You know, making art is, among other things, an occupation. It's a way for you to buy food and survive. And therefore, that's what economic rights protect. But the court says Section 28 is concerned with different rights. It's concerned with art as art, not art as a money-making machine. And so, of course, as I said, you'll recall that example of someone putting toilet paper on my statue. Well, someone put toilet 
put toilet paper on my statue, right? If I sold it, they're not infringing on my economic rights. They're not making copies and selling them to someone else. And they've already compensated me from that, from my statue, right? I've sold it. And so technically they can do whatever they want with it. That's also why important concept here, the court says that moral rights act is a continuing restraint upon the new owner. So in that case, typically, as we said, when you sell your stuff, the person can do essentially whatever they want with it, right? That's not the case here. So I sell my statue, they can do everything they want with it, but section 28, but stuff that infringes my moral rights. And so it's interpreted more restrictively because it's kind of scary that we have people reaching out and because people have legitimately paid for it, right? And what's happening in the Teberge case, right? We have Mr. Teberge that says, well, you know, I have this, this work. I think it's a painting or, or a piece of art that he sold. And then uh, whoever he sold it to starts making copies of it, right? And as it turns out, inexpensive copies. And that's allowed because he got paid in the first place. And under the rights he gave the person, he gets paid every time one of those copies gets sold. So it's allowed under the contract. And in fact, he gets paid every time. But what he says is, I'm an artist. I never thought that there would be 7,000 copies of my, of my piece of art. And I also never thought that it would be sold for 60 bucks. And that's to the prejudice of my honor and reputation, right? And the court says, you know, yes, Mr. Tibiage, um, in that case, you might be right. So the court goes back to section 28.2. As we said, it has to be the prejudice and, or, of the honor or reputation of the author. But, right, there are situations where you don't have to prove that, where it's assumed. And you'll see that. So 28.2, you can go find the Copyright Act. It's online for free. 28.2, Section 1, says what I just said. So what counts to the prejudice of the honor and reputation? Doing what? Distort, mutilate, or otherwise modify my work. Or, that's pretty self-explanatory, right? Distort, mutilate or modify, or use it in association with a product, service, or institution, right? Use it to sell McDonald's, which I think is bad, for example. Second paragraph says, in the case of a painting, sculpture, or engraving, right, the prejudice referred to in section, in subsection one, shall be deemed to have occurred. And so if you distort, mutilate, or otherwise modify. You don't have to learn this by heart, but it's important. If you distort, mutilate, or otherwise modify one of these three things, right? You don't have to directly prove that uh, you, um, you don't have to directly prove that you have in fact been prejudiced, that, that your honor and reputation has been prejudiced because it's assumed. And as we saw, that's just a rebuttable presumption. So it's true until someone shows otherwise. It's, it's a presumption. So by default, you don't have to prove it, but someone can prove otherwise. And if they successfully rebut the presumption, if they successfully show otherwise, then you will have to have proof to, you know, re rebut the presumption, right? And the court, right, refers to another example, which you don't read, which is the Eaton Center case. And what happens in the Eater Center case, basically, guy makes a sculpture of a bunch of, flo of birds flocking somewhere, and then Eaton Center purchases it. So again, they've purchased it. The guy's made money. They're now the owners. They can do whatever they want with it, at least to the extent it's allowed under the law. What do they do with it? Well, they point the flock of birds at their shopping center. And the guy says, well, you know, I didn't intend this, and it changes the meaning of my statue, right? I didn't intend the flock of birds to say, get into that mall. I intended them to say something else. And that's an interesting case that is different from my example of the toilet paper. The toilet paper is not mutilating, of course. I'm not, you know, mutilating the statue. I'm modifying its meaning, right, by putting something on it. That's even more nuanced, right? It's the place you're putting it that's changing its meaning. And the court says, yes, that's allowed. And so,
um, from a broad standpoint, right? There's also, this is not um, important, but another part of your moral rights is to be named. So oftentimes you'll have a right to be recognized as the author. So they won't be able to say, make a copy by removing your signature as an artist. Um, and that's it. So these are the two parts of the moral rights and um, is illustrated by both Mr. Tiberge and um, the Eaton Center case. Finally, the, um, the court. So I just wanted to give you the reference for um, what I've said before. So I told you before that, um, so I told you before that we have, uh, that the court says that moral rights act as a continuing restraint and the reference for that is paragraph 22. So paragraph 22, the court says moral rights are kind of weird exceptions because they let the artist control what the new owner of the work can do once they've legitimately purchased the work.